Uh, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to present a paper on sin and human nature in Judaism at this very distinguished al Mahdi Institute conference. Uh, this talk represents a practitioner's limited view of someone trained from an orthodox Jewish perspective. I also follow the Sephardic liturgical rite, not the more dominant Ashkenaz tradition. We've already heard two very profound presentations on sin and human nature from the Christian and Islamic traditions. I apologize if some of what I say may have already been covered. Uh, if so, perhaps this demonstrates that we have more in common than we realize. Prior to ordination, having worked in commerce for nearly two decades, I found that the world of ideas is a competitive one, and eventually there emerges a convergence. An excellent example of this is in Rabbi Michael Hilton's book, The Christian Effect on Jewish Life, analyzing how Judaism and Christianity have impacted each other since the early first centuries. The image on the screen that you see is Moses and Aaron with the Ten Commandments by Dutch painter Aaron de Chavez from 1675. For a long time, it hung on top of the Hechal, or the synagogue ark, that housed the scrolls of the law in this country's oldest synagogue, Bevis Marx. Built in 70, 1702, it has, over the past nearly 320 years, been in constant use until, of course, the pandemic struck last year. I will use old master paintings to illustrate some of the biblical scenes I'm going to describe, uh, but this is not meant to be taken literally, but simply to supplement the viewer's imagination. I begin with this slide because it, because it is from the community where I trained to be a rabbi, and because Judaism is a religion with many prescribed rules, both positive and negative. For example, give to the poor, do not commit adultery. It is a religion of great specificity, we calculate until what hour of the day a ritual prayer service can be performed or at what age a person reaches maturity. Some say the Bible has 613 commandments, the Hebrew Bible, and medieval scholars have compiled competing lists. Many more additional laws were added by rabbis of ancient times as precautionary means to prevent biblical infraction. An example is that for the, on the Sabbath, when uh, one mustn't light a fire, the rabbis added to the biblical rule the restriction of not handling any instruments that could be used to make a fire, such as matches, so that one might not inadvertently transgress. We study these rules in books of halakha, a word in Hebrew meaning the pathway, coming from the verb to walk. The Torah implies a doctrine of free will, but recognizes that we're all fallible. Perhaps the most important Jewish view towards sin is the principle of free will, that humans have an ability to choose between right action and wrong. Thus, we are wholly accountable for the accumulation of deeds that make up the journey we call our lifespan. A classic rabbinical parable of the relationship between the body and the soul comes from Leviticus Rabbah, where two guards, one blind and the other lame, were appointed by a king to watch over a fine fruit orchard. Though neither would individually be capable of consuming the fruit, working together with the sighted lame on the shoulder of the walking blind, they make their way to consume the king's forbidden fruit. So too will it be when the soul pleads before God that it was pure as a bird in the sky and therefore should be innocent, and the body claims that it was inert as the dust of the earth, God will bring the two together for judgment. Inevitably, humans will sin, and a Jewish remedy is what we call teshuva, meaning return, though often it is mistranslated as repentance. Teshuva involves a fourfold process, very similar to what was described uh, by the Sheikh. Confession, expression of regret, resolving not to reoffend, 
and resisting the same behavior when opportunity presents. When the temple was standing, private and communal offerings were part of teshuva. For example, each year the high priest on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, would send a scapegoat out into the wilderness, allegedly bearing the sins of the people. Thrown to its death, this process affected forgiveness for the nation. Daily sin and guilt offerings were also part of the temple ritual. What I've given you is a brief framework for understanding a Jewish view of sin, um, but I'd like to just specify that there are different levels of transgression, also similar to what was expressed by our Islamic colleague. Pesha refers to rebellion against God. That is one of the most extreme levels of sin. Avon uh, is succumbing to uncontrollable desire. And Chet uh, refers to unintentional sins. From mild to severe, the remedies could include monetary compensation, temple offerings, lashes, or even capital punishment. Most of these rulings are taught through oral tradition called the Mishnah and the Talmud, compiled between the second and fifth centuries, which interprets the Hebrew scripture. One more important distinction, which also was raised just a few moments ago, is that transgression between human beings, such as robbery or murder, are treated more severely in the Jewish tradition than transgressions against God, though both are uh, serious. Um, an example of, of a transgression of, against God might be the, the uh, violation of the Sabbath, as I cited just recently. This is implied by the forgiveness ritual of Yom Kippur, that is the severity uh, of sins committed uh, between human beings. The Day of Atonement, according to Maimonides, a 12th century medieval Sephardi scholar and eminent legal authority, uh, in his laws of Teshuvah, codified that in addition to private confessions, one cannot receive atonement on Yom Kippur for sins committed against another human being until the victim has been appeased directly. So this is a brief framework for understanding a Jewish view of sin. And in the coming moments, I would like to share a simplified analysis of what I'm calling a divine response framework or prototype to sin, each drawn from the five books of Moses. There are three, three sets of examples that I'm going to present. The first is sin which was met by divine punishment. The second, where sin was resolved by human intervention, and the third, where sin went partially or wholly unredeemed. The first scenario is the sin of Genesis 3-4, comprised of three separate but cumulative incidents. The first couple eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Cain killing his brother Abel, and the murder of Cain by a sixth generation descendant, Lamech. Second is the sale of Joseph by his brothers, and his subsequent rise to power as viceroy over Egypt. In an elaborate psychological drama, Joseph later staged a scenario nearly identical to his own mistreatment to see if his brothers had truly learned a lesson of compassion. Third is the sin of the golden calf of Exodus 32, Moses' efforts to effect forgiveness and the establishment of the tabernacle, the place from where sacrifices could be brought. Also included is the lesser known sin of the Israelites and the 12 spies reported in Numbers, the book of Numbers chapter 14, which has, I believe, repercussions to this day. Um, I have included both Hebrew and English in the scriptural sources. The story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is probably one of the best known across the globe, heard by nearly 4 billion people professing to be Christians and Muslims, and along with that, a few million Jews. Gifted a paradise to live in on condition they observed but one restriction, the first couple proved inadequate to the challenge and were seduced to consume the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The man blamed the woman, and the woman blamed the serpent. The seemingly tragic result was expulsion from the garden and a series of curses or hardships they were condemned to bear in perpetuity. Some interpretations suggest human beings were intended to be immortal and divine-like, 
but that this incident brought mortality to creation. Others, however, posit that the sin was simply one of immense ingratitude. Though it is difficult myth mytholo though it is a difficult mythology, fraught with many notions that today are objectionable uh, through our, our current lens, Judaism sees human beings as capable of rectifying their misbehavior. Only later, much later, perhaps after the 10th century, after the publication of a my mystical text called the Zohar, did any suggestion emerge of the kind of universal uh, stain, uh, as was alluded to by both of the former speakers, that such a stain on the soul of the first couple could possibly be transmitted to their offspring, though this is not a widely held view uh, in mainstream Judaic thought. The former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom and Commonwealth, the late Lord Jonathan Sachs, pointed out an oft noticed progression. After they sinned, in response to God's question, where are you? Adam and Eve responded, they were hiding due to the shame of their nakedness. So let us call this the first generation of sin, character characterized by a sense of shame. In the next chapter, the story of Cain killing his brother Abel is jarring from the point of view of Cain's response to God. When asked, where is Abel your brother? Cain questioned God in return, asking, am I my brother's keeper? To the surprise of the discerning reader, Cain is punished with exile, not given the customary punishment of himself being put to death. Perhaps this is a sign of God's long-standing mercy. And I'll take this moment just to digress to say that for those who are, who are uh, familiar with the Hebrew language, um, in the first chapter of Genesis, which describes the creation, the word uh, for God that is used repeatedly is the word Elohim. Um, in the second chapter, the word used is Adonai. Both are used uh, frequently in the Hebrew scriptures. One we attribute to a characteristic of judgment, that is the first the first chapter of Genesis, and the second is attributed to the attribute of mercy. Um, and this is important because uh, the idea of people being able to live without mercy is an incompatibility. So in, in, the, in the story of Cain and Abel, we finally reach what might be called, to the surprise of a discerning reader, Cain is punished, punished with exile. Uh, and not given the customary punishment of himself being put to death. So let us call this the second generation of sin, which is characterized by denial. And finally, we reach what might be called the third generation of sin, when in an obscure verse, Lamech, without a hint of remorse, boasts of having killed his ancestor Cain. By then, corruption seemed so widespread that the Almighty despaired of any course of action. And after yet waiting 10 generations for improvement, reset the matrix via a cataclysmic flood. With regards to our discussion of the three descending generations of sin, where Adam and Eve felt shame, Cain tried to deny his actions, and Lamech boasted of his crime, the late chief rabbi, reminds us that the rabbis of the Talmud teach an axiomatic point, that once a person has committed a sin three times, they then begin to consider not only that it isn't prohibited, but that the act may even be permitted. Perhaps this explains why we have so many uh, rabbinic rulings uh, to help uh, prevent us from committing biblical sins. You may understand from this that the human spirit or soul is desensitized by sin. To quote another rabbinic dictum, the wages of sin are themselves sin. The rabbis of the Talmud, if not even earlier, understood that behavior determines our proximity to God. One who lives a good or sanctified life will bring more sanctity into the world, whereas the opposite is true for one who transgresses. Jew, transgresses. Jewish law almost micromanages the, the 
the the day from beginning to end to instill positive behavior habits to constantly remind individuals of our sacred status. Our second example of sin, which is resolved by human intervention, is the story of Joseph the Dreamer, popularized through local media in the performance Joseph in the Technicolor Coat. Being his, fa his, father's, his father Jacob's favorite because he was the firstborn of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, Joseph was envied by his brothers to the point they intended to kill him. Judah's intervention instead led to him being sold to a merchant caravan and taken to Egypt. After further trials and tribulations and through his ability to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, he rose to the post of Viceroy of Egypt. <clears throat> this is, by the way, this is one of my favorite paintings, the, the painting of Joseph sold by his brothers, uh, by Flavitsky. Um, I think that the, the you could almost call it iconology, iconography, uh, parallels, uh, at least in my mind, uh, something that might look like uh, the crucifixion uh, that happened uh, many, many centuries later. When famine struck and his brothers came to Egypt to purchase grain, Joseph entrapped them in a scheme to force his younger brother Benjamin to be brought to Egypt. But Jacob was still unconsoled by the loss of Joseph and overprotective of Rachel's second son, Benjamin, he refused. The brothers persisted and when the food ran out, like chess, pawn, like chess pawns in a game that they had no control over, they returned to Egypt. The story culminated in Benjamin being framed for theft and threatened with imprisonment in Egypt, realizing the calamity that was on their doorstep would cause their elderly father perhaps even to die in despair. Judah employing the only free will that still remained, rose up to defend and protect their youngest brother. Rabbinic scholars see this as a paradigm for teshuva, forgiveness, as we described earlier. Having passed the test of being in the same mental and spiritual place as they had been 22 years prior, the brother's compassion for, Je for Benjamin melted Joseph's resolve and he, received, he revealed himself, and, uh, and the story ended with a happy family reunion. Moving further to our third example of sin, we skip forward a few more hundred years in biblical history to the golden calf. <clears throat> Putting aside the awesome description of the revelation of the Decalogue and the 40-day sojourn of the prophet Moses atop Mount Sinai, a small group at the base of the mountain seems to have panicked at the lack of leadership, demanding Aaron the high priest to create a molten image to lead them. Though this section occupies only six verses in the Torah, the repercussions occupied the remainder of the book of Exodus. Moses, having been sent down the mountain by God in anger, shattered the first set of tablets. But when the Almighty threatened to destroy the entire nation, Moses leapt into the mend, uh, leapt into mend relations between the Israelites and God. And after another period atop the mountain, he won a concession and the people were forgiven. Moreover, this became the paradigm for all future situations where divine mercy was required. Using a formula for appeasing God's wrath, the event is commemorated each year in the Jewish calendar on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. This sin paradigm seems to have had an effective result. But the event of the 12 spies is more problematic to those of us who follow rabbinic Judaism. The text in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 seems inconclusive and ambiguous. Twelve spies sent to investigate the land of Canaan for its vulnerabilities returned with a dispar ten returned with a disparaging report, and two tried to defend them. To de to defend the, the land. Coincidentally, after forty days, 
they returned with rich samples of its harvest, and yet the demoralizing report of the majority created great distress in, in the general population, bringing them to tears of extreme grief until they regretted having been taken out of Egypt from slavery in the first place. It was a case of self-induced fear that set off a great panic. Ingratitude elicited a harsh response from God, who condemned that generation to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they died of natural causes. But the sin seems to never have been fully remedied. It is commemorated in the Jewish calendar annually on the 9th of Av, known as the saddest day of the Jewish year. Moreover, the Mishnah records it as a day of calamity throughout the generations, being linked to the destruction of both the first and the second Jewish temples, as well as a host of other tragedies over the centuries. Examples given include the First Crusades, the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492, etc. It would appear that greater than the sin of the Garden of Eden or the sin of the Golden Calf, this seemingly seemingly inconsequential sin of the spies has caused the greatest harm. Dr. Jeremy Schoenfield uh, at the Leo Beck College in an as yet unpublished article suggests it may be the one sin that we are still waiting to see resolved. One Jewish view is that perfection will only come through a change in human behavior, which will either precipitate or will um, require the spiritual intervention of a messianic figure. Not for naught have the rabbis of the Talmud more than 1500 years ago forecast that just as the temple was destroyed on the 9th of Av, so too will the Messiah be born on that occasion. To summarize and conclude, we've explored Jewish ideas of free will, halacha, and teshuva, acknowledging that human beings are imperfect, but that remedies are available when we veer away from our connection to help us return to the divine. In that way, we are responsible for our actions. We have a primary duty to avoid causing harm and an opportunity to bring about positive change. We've looked at different models of divine response to human sin as they appear in the Torah and can identify parallels in the behavior of biblical figures relevant still today. Jealousy towards one another, mistrust in leadership, and indifference to sin are a few examples. These manifest both at an individual as well as a collective level and are cause for much suffering. The early sages of the Mishnah informed that the world continues to exist because of three pillars. Torah, which we can interpret more broadly as divine wisdom. Avodah, which is religious worship. worship and Gemilut Chasadim, acts of loving kindness. It is my view that we have within our capacity an ability to resolve many of the challenges of today by applying principles from the past. Divine wisdom and worship are important, yet we are probably most critically at this time in need of more actions of loving kindness. The pandemic has taught me that to be most effective, we have to work across faiths and cultures. The organizations that I'm involved with have built many bridges over the years which proved to be uh, invaluable use uh, for providing things like medicine and food, food banks, clothing drives, uh, and more. So I am pleased that the conversation has already uh, jumped in the direction of how we can cooperate more together. And I look forward uh, to the next set of questions and answers.